audio is live and here we are guys hello everybody we are live it's the michael brooks show and obviously we're a little bit off format but we are never off our game with super producer matt leck chief economist and candy man auditioner with that shot david griscom how's it going everybody on this week's yeah. michael let me just say hi again because my my i have a weird mic situation hi everybody i'm here is it is it good everybody heard from everybody okay beautiful on this week's program ronan burton shaw editor of the tribune we're talking about the uk in lockdown and the neoliberal grand theft spree, how to end it. The long march through the institutions between the United States and the United Kingdom that we need to have happen. Then, our great friend, Milton Alamadi, he's hanging out with us later. We're talking about a little bit Belt and Road Initiative and the opportunity for Africa. We're also talking about what the World Bank what the IMF have done to Africa's health systems in the era of pandemic. Of course, we've got a gem. Of course, we're gonna review Donald Trump's absolute disaster press conference. And we also have shout outs emerging from the union movement, from mutual aid, as people start demanding an end to rent, walking off of work sites, and the percolation of rent strikes and general strikes are in the air. Bernie Sanders is staying in as he has the most important, by far, national leadership taking place right now. Rashida Tlaib with the Boost Act, the most important bill in the House right now for relief and not corporate theft. Bill Barr is trying to use this opportunity to keep people in indefinite detention without trial, as we see the synergy of corporate theft and the military corporate Silicon Valley governmental hybrid rollback of every facet of our privacy and civil liberties, the things we need in order to be able to fight back. All of that and much, much more on this week's Michael Brooks Show. If you're watching this, our dope, amazing new track from Napoleon the Legend and our dope, amazing traditional track from DJ Anarchy. Neither of them are being played, but you'll hear it in post, so relax. Shouts to those guys. Uh, and as always, we just say up front, we hope the sound is good. And that's it. Finito. And it, it will get better every single week. We improve. It will get better every yes. single week. It really, honestly, it really should be better already than last week. I'm re I really am hoping. It is, yeah. Um, okay. I think so, too. All right. So first, we're going to talk a, a little bit about uh, – I'm going I'm to kind of do a broader overview in the con commentary section, and then we're actually going to talk about what's shaping up to be a massive corporate theft, theft and formalization of corporate oligarchy uh, – that I, looks to be passing uh, the Senate uh, and, 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 and probably the House as well, shortly to be sent to Trump's desk. But look, big picture, we are at a crossroads. And we need to actually decide not just whether or not we're going to have capitalism or a form of socialism, but really whether or not we're going to have capitalism or democracy. The best practitioners of capitalism, the people who arguably believed in it the most, the Keynesians understood it better, and the Keynesians had a rational response to it. But the people who looked at capitalism as a god that all other human values and systems should subordinate to, just as you see today, the lieutenant governor of uh, Texas, we'll talk about it in the postgame, suggesting that people should die to keep the economy going. Donald Trump having an anxiety attack, wanting people to go out to work to keep the economy going. Thomas Friedman, which we will also talk about in the post game, giving you the upmarket version of you dying for Wall Street profits. And let's be very clear, there's no choice here. The choices are not isolate, save ourselves, be prudent in a pandemic and listen to what every uh, infectious disease specialist says, or take a giant risk and keep the economy going. The obvious path is 
give every single human being $2,000 a month, provide health care, massively intervene in public services, and subsidize and protect small businesses and all the other obvious steps. There's nothing difficult about this. The reason that we don't do that is because of something called um, the labor theory of value for one. At the end of the day, Wall Street's hoarding of wealth and money in all of private businesses and corporations hoarding of wealth and money is predicated on stealing part of your labor in classical Marxist terminology, but again, just the truth of how power works, your hourly wage, your hourly wage hides the relationship between you and your employer. What you are getting sucked out in terms of your surplus labor is what creates profit. They need you to be doing this. There's also a more relative and immediate political question. If rents are freezed, if moratoriums come into play, if there's debts are struck, if UBI is delivered along with healthcare and housing and other essential services and basics, then we can start to learn a bigger lesson about what is available in our societies today. Because as everybody knows, everything that was just ranted and whined about as supposedly being unrealizable because of its cost with Bernie Sanders is exceeded in a matter of days. So it's a political question and it's a fundamental question about how capitalism works. And in order for capitalism to keep working like this, you need to hack at democracy. Hayek, Milton, von Mises, Trump, Friedman, Bloomberg, and Blankfein are not believers in real democracy. Some formally not, and some in the only the most limited, narrow variety possible. If we had an actual response of democracy, everybody would be at home in safety and material protection with no rent to pay. But we don't because we subordinate democracy to capitalism. We need to graduate from capitalism and restore democracy because there's two very clear choices here. There is an anti-egalitarian, authoritarian depravity, which we've already outlined in terms of talking about going back to work and this horrifying sacrifice of life for GDP. There's also Attorney General Bill Barr trying to sneak through a DOJ request suggesting that in times of quote unquote emergency, which are pretty often in today's world, that judges can keep people in pretrial detention indefinitely. That's a fundamental attack on habeas corpus. That is apartheid style stuff. ICE and immigration have been continuing their raids, terrorizing people at hospitals and one absolutely obscene example, dressing up as doctors to go to someone's home, I had even read. Trump's response has, of course, been a disaster and has lurked between xenophobia, fear-mongering, magical thinking, some listening to Dr. Fauci, and now back to anxiety about his reelection. The right is prepared to use this for a corporate theft bill that we're gonna talk about in a second, which looks to be set to pass, as well as another attack on our civil liberties. We need to center human needs here. The democratic leadership is of course failing. They're not willing to use leverage. Nancy Pelosi will go down as maybe the least effective opposition leader in human history. And this is not just a question of politics here. We know that Lancey Pelosi is wealthy and corporate oriented and will not fight for poor and working people. But no politician worth their salt would ever not use leverage in a situation like this to make the executive pay. Polls indicate now steadily a majority of Americans approving of Trump's handling a crisis that he made a crisis by ignoring out of the gate. And that is a testament to the extraordinary failure of Democratic leadership, in particular Nancy Pelosi, and in particular when he does show up to cough in his hands, Joe Biden. We need a Green New Deal. We need mutual aid, micro and macro organizing. We need every single person in mass industry to be worker cooperative owned or labor union uh, cooperative base labor union representation on boards, like in a German model at, a bare, at the bare minimum. We can make a case for these provisions today and bring forms of them into being on a more or less permanent basis if we fight and if we're creative and if we make demands and organize at the local, state, national, and even global levels. We cannot afford a lackluster response 
like we did in 2008. There are two futures, capitalism or democracy, and we need to decide which side we're going to be on. You guys have anything to add to that? We'll get to the bailout in a second, but you guys, uh, there's a lot there. Anything uh, you guys want to add to that? We're, we're most certainly at a crossroads. People recognize that things need to be done. And I think, you know, I'll talk about this a little bit more in the gem, but I think making very clear to people the way that these institutions and who they're reacting for right now should make it very clear that, you know, the idea that we live in a democracy is almost is fairly laughable. Um, it's very clear that the government institutions, their first responsibility is to um, to look out for corporations and the wealthy and not for the millions and millions of working class people who are really struggling right now. Uh, we need to be hitting that point, both in the kind of larger rhetorical place, but then also on the practical level, too. That's where, as Michael was saying, hitting these local initiatives is going to be very important. This crisis is a global crisis, but a lot of the response is going to have to come from the, uh, the, the local level and being in the position to organize and to um, be the first people on the ground and shape the narrative and also shape the response is something that we really need to be prepared to do and we need to be doing yesterday. Absolutely. And now let's talk about what's in this bill. It's just coming together just now. We have some sound of Larry Kudlow, uh, which we are going to play. Uh, and I will say, um, Larry Kudlow seems like, I mean, he seems he seems a lot less heart attacky uh, during this press conference, if you know what I'm saying. Are we ready? Yeah. That fund, by the way, will be overseen by an oversight board and an inspector general. It will be completely transparent. So the total package here comes to roughly $6 trillion, $2 trillion uh, direct assistance, roughly $4 trillion in Federal Reserve lending power. Again, it will be the largest Main Street financial package in the history of the United States. Liquidity and cash for families, small business, individuals, unemployed, to keep this thing going. We're heading for a rough period, but it's only going to be weeks, we think. Weeks, months, not going to be years, that's for sure. And hopefully pave the way for continued economic recovery uh, after this uh, uh, crisis. Uh, that fund, by the way. All right, so let's let's be really clear about this. And we don't know, you know, we'll, we'll find out more uh, as it comes together. There's two elements of a package. One element is deliver emergency assistance to Americans, which is, of course, the only thing that should be a priority here. We're talking what should be monthly for at least a year, direct cash transfers, expanding unemployment, payroll tax uh, rebates, and, of course, emergency infusions, what should obviously be Medicare for all, but even just in these political terms, emergency infusions into health and uh, medical investment, hospitals, right? Then the other part of this is an infusion into the corporate sector. And it's a really big problem that these two things are being fused together because, as you would expect, you're going to basically see it looks like what's shaping up in this bill is that... The Democrats held out. There will be some, I think it's going to be 3000 for family, 1500 for individuals, cash. There's going to be unemployment. There's going to be some other provisions that are totally not sufficient, but they will slightly soften the blow. And then added investments for hospitals. By the way, speaking of political malpractice, how the hell does that become a win? Mm -hmm. the, the, Mitch McConnell refusing to talk about extra money for hospitals in the first version of his bill, or barely any at all, should have just been a Democratic opportunity to beat the shit out of Republicans. So great, the money's there. How that was even a win in a situation like this is insane. But there you have it. Then the next part is a completely un uh, unmonitored, I mean, sure, very transparent. Larry Kudlow, Steve Mnuchin, and as David will talk about later, for the first time, if, if I'm understanding correctly, the Fed giving money directly to corporations. So in other words, not just infusing the economy and setting interest rates in a way that's stimulating, or even providing you know, government bailout funds that filter their way into the banks, but literally handoffs to corporations directly. Basically, a complete another level of consolidation into the American economy, what Matt Stoller calls corporate oligarchy. So we need to be really specific here in unwinding what's happening because you've had, broadly speaking, a dual track process 
where we've had great people like Bernie Sanders and Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar and AOC putting forward serious people bailout oriented stuff. Then we've had some people doing some solid work, Sherrod Brown, as an example, nowhere near comprehensive enough, but kind of decent, basic, progressive-ish sort of things, and a little bit, frankly, from Schumer. Nowhere near sufficient, but some modest contributions in a time of Great Depression-level crisis. That's one side of it. And then the other side is a massive corporate feeding frenzy for companies that, as an example, the CEO of Boeing earlier said today, hey, if this is going to come a lot of strings, I don't want it. Well, first of all, fuck you. And secondly, that should be the question. And yes, this scumbag, Matt is holding up the picture, this scumbag Mnuchin is going to oversee a giant, essentially slush fund. Remember, the only reason he's Treasury Secretary is because Kamala Harris chose to not press charges against him for his conduct in the conduct in the mortgage market in California. So you are right now, as a Republican lobbyist said the other day, an, a time like this is a great opportunity for me and for my clients to paraphrase, but something to that effect. You're going to see more consolidation. You're going to see added employees at CVS and Walgreens. You're going to see a huge crunch on small business, which is a serious problem. And you're going to see also, if you're interested in rights and justice for less formal sectors of the economy, taking everything out of cash is a really big problem for undocumented people, as an example, uh, and other folks uh, who work in different parts of the economy. So there's huge civil liberties rights issues as well. And basically, you're going to see a piecemeal approach that will slightly soften the blow and another uh, very comprehensive move towards a complete corporate looting of this country. That's the state of play right now. And we need to unwind it. And we need to be very clear about what all the provisions are um, and, and get into the, this is one where we do need to get into the real policy details because we're going to be unworking this stuff for a long time. Yeah, and you know, and if you look at just how much work we didn't do after the financial crisis in 08, the fact that this is almost a kind of short-sighted repeat of the same mistakes is very, very frightening. Um, and we should not be let the Republicans get away with it. And we specifically need to make sure that Democrats don't fall in line uh, with any kind of plan or policy that's going to leave the same kind of structural holes um, in our economy. Because we've had a weak system for a very long time that has always been exposed to this. We talk about this on the show almost every week, how exposed we are to a kind of outside crisis like this. And we're seeing it hit really hard right now, and we're not prepared to deal with it. Absolutely. All right, let's talk about the positive side here <clears throat> um, in the shout out. Let me start with this. This is New York specific, but everywhere in the country, people should be demanding this. And I want to be really clear, demanding things like immediate rent freezes um, and is, is essential completely. And it also opens up a bigger conversation of what we need to have, because we need to have, as an example, of course, national rent control in this country, serious, high quality and massively deployed public housing. So homelessness is a thing that and housing insecurity generally does not exist in this country. And we also need a big jubilee. We need to wipe medical debt. We need to wipe student debt. The same computer key that can put a pause if the federal government directs it or just manifest trillions of dollars to in, in, in theft for you know, corporations, including the Mars company, right? And the candy manufacturers. This is going to be larded up with every piece of corporate bullshit imaginable. Uh, overseen by absolutely horrid, despicable people like Steve Mnuchin. We have the money to do everything. And if you, you're in New York, I want you to look at this uh, document we have up. This is a great piece. This is from Mutual Aid NY Group. And it's a comprehensive list. I tweeted it out to um, maybe if you, you know what, just pause on it for a second and take a screenshot. These are all the different people you can call to demand that there be a rent stoppage in New York. And again, every state needs a version of this bill and you need to demand obviously that this happen on a federal level. I don't know what's in the federal bill at this. If landlords uh, from mass corporations, I've heard things on both ends. I've heard 
examples in local communities uh, where I, I know of one landlord who came forward and said, look, uh, I would just like people to help me with water and utility bill, but I'm not collecting extra rent. Um, so they knocked it off, you know, like $700. That's great. And that a small scale landlord can choose to do things like that. That's great. I've seen uh, texts from big landlord conglomerates saying you're still obligated to pay full at the end of the month. If you get a text like that, you should share it on social media. And you should let the world know about the kind of people and corporations you're dealing with. Uh, and, and that's absolutely something um, I would do. Now, you need to call everybody. In New York, it so happens, and let's get to the senator's uh, tweet uh, next. Uh, Senator Mike Giannaris from Queens has a cancel rent bill in the state Senate. Julia Salazar, among others, have co-sponsored it. And tomorrow, and I will tweet out, we will all tweet out, maybe we'll try to put in the show notes, a directory number for the New York State Senate where you can call. And again, I would call and do, I would do all of these things. I would call your senators, your reps, demand they co-sponsor a version of Rashida's Boost Act, ask them to make sure the DOJ indefinite detention does not go through. And on each state level in New York, you can call for a rent freeze with the GNRS bill, but every single state in the country should have comprehensive rent freeze legislation that then, of course, leads to uh, other uh, steps in terms of rent control um, and, and public housing. If this doesn't happen on a policy level, and in order to make it happen on a policy level, people need to take initiative and make power and, and do power. And the importance of labor can never be underestimated. Labor is key. There's no strategic way for the left without mass labor or mobilization because that is the only mass area that the left has countervailing power to capital. That's not a moral judgment, that's a strategic reality. Let's go give a shout out to these amazing Purdue workers in Georgia. And this is happening yeah. across the country. People are walking off, Amazon factories have shut uh, from what I, I heard, I believe they shut down one at least briefly in Queens. People are walking off different jobs. It's dangerous. And do not listen to any of these motherfuckers who tell you to go back to work in this environment. Obviously, if you absolutely have to, you probably already are. Many Americans are in that situation. They're terrorized by the economy. We need to fight. The question is not allowing Donald Trump to seize the terrain of people needing to get a paycheck. The question is seizing a terrain from all of these people, which is that no one should live like this at any time, and your life should not be put at risk anytime. These Purdue workers did it. Let's play this clip. Out of the plant Monday morning. Kendall and Granville, one of the workers who left the plant, says people still working on the production line say they've been exposed to coronavirus. All we're asking now is just to sanitize the building. Sanitize the building. Everybody that's been exposed to it, they need to go home. These folks are still on the floor. Diamond Gray says this is about more than coronavirus concerns. She says they are tired of accepting the bare minimum. There's talk about, you know, there's going to be more promotion and more pay for the company, but nobody's seen that. But I think a lot of people are just tired and the virus involved also. I think it's just got to the point to where enough is enough. James Braz. That's it. And that's and this is so, and that and I'm so glad she said that because that first step of you're fucking killing us now. And then the second step of and by the way, all this other stuff you've been talking about is not coming through either. So all props, all solidarity to them. It's very fast moving. And it's another thing that if you have the capacity, a lot of people don't, some people do. Uh, let's look around to see, you know, how to get resources to people who are walking off the job and striking and, and, and just not complying. Ultimately, that's the great irony of all of this. Everything is in favor of capital, except for your labor. Well, and that's the thing, too, that's very, you know, it was making this moment very clear for a lot of people, too, is the power that labor has. So you see in that clip, folks are recognizing the fact that, you know, if they stop going to work, uh, you know, this entire country would shut down. You know, I grew up, um, you know, growing up 
in, 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 when I was in South Carolina, a lot of my good friends, their parents were truck drivers, and they always were very passionate about the ideas. Like, if I didn't go into work, you wouldn't have anything on the shelves. Uh, and it's even more true now. I mean, we're even more reliant on the ability of, of all the transit that goes in uh, into our basic consumer goods right now. And I think the more power that workers recognize they have, the more that they can exercise that. And I think this could be a very important, actually, reshuffling moment if we have the political will and the organizations to uh, capture that energy 100 percent, and that's the momentum and that's the energy and that's that belief in those people like those extraordinary people that we just watched that video taking that incredibly courageous decision which is fucking terrifying um and going up against you know a pernicious disgusting thing like purdue that by the way is risking your life right now you heard the other part of that like they're risking the the, the virus getting into their supply chain happily so you know, be very aware of, of the, you know, if what they're saying is true, which I 1 million percent people don't like when I, you know, go beyond 100. So let me say I 1 trillion percent believe those workers. All right, let's do a quick uh, plug and then we'll get to our buddy Ronan Burton Shaw. Uh, folks, uh, you know, yeah, short and sweet. If you can, this is a very good time to become a patron uh, because we need to, of course, sustain everything we do. Uh, right now we are. We're holding steady. We're basically getting as many people joining as people were losing. Um, and we still need to keep all of this running and, you know, get checks out and do everything and, you know, support people in our various networks and, and you know, live ourselves, obviously, and keep growing the show, keep moving forward. So if you can, patreon.com slash TMBS. If you want to stay on and you need a deal, just send us a message. We hook people up. We always have. Um, and obviously we will in this circumstance as well. Um, so just let us know. Patreon.com slash TMBS. You can go buy my book on pre-order at Amazon or Red Emma's just send us uh, Against the Web, Cosmopolitan Case, Against the New Right. Joining us now all the way, I believe he's in London at the moment, is our good friend Ronan Burton Shaw. He's the editor of the Tribune magazine. Great, great and very noble history periodical in the UK. Ronan, uh, one week ago, they were talking in the uh, nudge unit, which you'll explain to us in a second. And inside the, uh, the, 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 the uh, you know, corridors of power in the UK that they weren't going to do some big melodramatic bullshit like the continental Europeans. They were going to create some good common sense. They were going to Get the virus, smile, and carry on. Now, all of a sudden, you guys are almost in a state of martial law. First of all, say hi to Matt and David, and then tell us what the hell happens. Those things, lads. Um, yeah, I think I cut across you a bit there. Sorry, I clicked the link a bit early. No, uh, you yeah, know, it's been it's been a uh, it's been an interesting few weeks over here. Obviously, um, there's been this rapid uh, development of the government line, which uh, began with the the government making this case that Britain would diverge from the rest of uh, Europe on the question of coronavirus. Um, that we would um is that where is that one coming from sorry is that coming from me or is it coming from you it wouldn't be me um just so, click off everything if you can yeah that's okay great good. all right thanks so, uh, so basically what they uh what they said was uh we were going to allow the virus to pass through the um uh the population there was this theory of herd immunity uh, and the idea was look if we try to suppress the peak too uh rapidly now what will end up happening uh, is that there'll be this second peak uh, when people get released from a lockdown and the result of that will be you know much worse when the nhs is in a much worse uh, position in, in in the winter they rapidly turned uh, uh on that position because it was unsustainable the the evidence is now uh, very clear from Italy about what happens if you try to allow this uh, virus pass through the population. Uh, just a few days ago, uh, Italy had 800 people die in just 24 hours. Uh, Britain is not massively dissimilar in terms of its population demographics, a lot of older people uh, in this country. And so you would 
probably have been looking at a similar scale disaster and we still might be down the line looking at a similar scale disaster here because of those those approaches and as you said it comes from this um, i mean one of the most important structural influences over that way of thinking was this nudge unit um who are these you know um behavioral economist types um who believe that they're able to uh, perfectly uh, figure out what human behavior is going to be based on these abstract statistical models um, and they thought they'd gotten far too clever and that they'd figured this out better than everyone else we were simply going to cocoon the vulnerable uh, they had no plans for what the cocooning was going to look like in terms of say for instance what happens if somebody has a need for a carer what happens if somebody has got an underlying condition but is in a household with uh, people who don't have underlying conditions and they're going to be interacting normally with the world and this person isn't and are they going to be locked in a room for this entire period of what's going to happen of course the whole idea of organizing cocooning like that particularly you know uh, at a kind of uh, breakneck speed was impossible and so they ended up having to follow the rest of the europeans and uh, that's where we are now we're in a, a state of lockdown it was pretty eerie walking around i mean i'm in croydon which is a uh, anyone knows there's a deep south london um it was pretty eerie uh we we're allowed out for one you know uh exercise per day um that's that's basically your max go to the shopping once a week uh, one exercise per day and then there's essential workers uh, are in but there is the you know parts of the economy are still going and this is something that's been that they found in italy as well i don't know if you guys are going to get to a stage of lockdown I mean, some of what donald trump's been saying over there is so completely insane it's yeah. impossible. I, it's impossible. I thought i thought it would i actually honest i was pretty confident it was coming and now I, I mean, because also, and to be clear, it's not just, I mean, you, it's the down market, Fox News and Donald Trump, but there's the Thomas Friedman column, Andrew Cuomo, who the liberals are all gaga over, has actually said a few things like it himself. So, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I actually, if I understood the Thomas Friedman column, I basically think he found, he, he found some somebody from Yale to sort of advise something similar to what you guys just stopped if i was reading it correctly so it's, yeah. it's a disaster yeah i mean look and there's all kinds of models you can put forward in these cases right um but there's their guesstimates we haven't had a pandemic on this scale in 100 years so the idea that people take chances with it is absolutely crazy but that's what these people you know particularly the ones who are more into the kind of behavioral science stuff who really believe they've mapped out human behavior based on these you know rational choice theory nonsenses that have dragged their entire discipline of economics into the gutter the last few years i mean they really believe they can they figured it out and they're they're cleverer than the world health organization they're dangerous dangerous people but obviously See, look, there's a broader question here, I think, for the left, which is what does this tell us about, about the, the system that we're in at the moment? I go back to, um, there's a great quote Marx had when he was talking about the Crimean War. Um, and obviously, this is a, a similar scenario to, uh, to a war. There's no point in denying that. This, the, the changes that are happening to all of our lives now, I mean, are the most dramatic we've seen outside of wartime. Um, and Marx said of the Crimean War, as exposure to the atmosphere reduces all mummies to instant dissolution, so war passes supreme judgment upon social systems that have outlived their vitality. And here, we have a, a situation that is comparable to that. Uh, we're finding out now that we live under a, an economic order that can't deal with the consequences of people not shopping for just a few days, not going to restaurants for just a few days, not going to cafes for just a few days. We were already facing into a decade that was going to be incredibly challenging and expose the unsustainable and fragile nature of capitalism because we were facing into a decade where the climate crisis was going to get worse. And we've seen in recent years the impact of an economic system that's destroying the world around us. Uh, we have seen over the last 10 years uh, an economic model where inequality was growing, uh, where there was growing disillusionment, uh, and there was economic stagnation in most of the developed or core capitalist countries. That produced a political system where you had these constant shocks, right? So you had, uh, basically since 2014-15, a vast majority of the bigger political events that happened were you know, cast as surprises, you, whether it was the election of, of Syriza in Greece, the rise of the Podemos in Spain, that was, these were the first ones. And then you had 
Brexit and you have Trump and then you have the rise of the far right uh, in, a, in a really quite coordinated uh, way across the, the core capitalist countries, parties which were written off by liberals a few years ago as impossibilities. You know, our, our good, nice liberal order um, could never possibly sustain post-fascist parties like the National Front and whatever in France, and all of which was proven wrong. Um, and you, I mean, all of this comes into uh, a kind of profound uh, sense that the system was facing crises on multiple levels. I think probably the geopolitical one should be added to that, right? The new multipolar world we're coming to with the competition between America and China and a lot more chaotic environment. Um, so we were going to see the, the limitations of this system anyway, right? We were going to see a big recession no question in this next decade, we now landed into the middle of it. And the question is, to what degree can the ruling class piece together some kind of a plan to get through this? I think for the left, what we're going to find is even if we get beaten with Corbyn, even if we get beaten with Bernie, our ideas are only going to become more relevant over the next 10 years because this system is not going to be sustainable. And they're going to have to try a radical reform to keep it going. And in the meantime, political opportunities will be there uh, for those of us who, who think it's fundamentally unsustainable. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. And I want to, actually, I want to come back a little bit because I want to even spell out even more some of the behavioral economics nudge stuff. Um, but before that, and this gets very specific to a conversation you and I have had, I guess, uh, you know, publicly, you know, and, and just as friends on the phone or is in order, though, to sustain that. OK, there, if there's if there's three trends, one trend is just that the reason there's a growing appetite for, uh, you know, uh, uh, Sanders policies or Corbyn policies, a renewed interest in various types of socialistic mobilization, whether it's local mutual aid or whether it's, you know, using Marxist frameworks to understand a multipolar world or deal with climate crisis or deal also, by the way, with enormous advances in artificial intelligence and robotics and all these other areas that we have no governance model for and are in the hands of you know, a, a profoundly dangerous and militarized platform capitalism. You know, that's something I would also add to the mix. Um, there is, there's this material reality that drives the interest. Then there's the fact that we are getting beat, and there's different lessons as to why we're getting beat. And I think particularly in the United States, I, you know, and it, it speaks to a lot of shortcomings on the left inside itself, which we need to work on. It speaks to institutional weakness. And the third thing that I want to kind of put into the mix is I, I think overturn window rhetoric is fine. I, I don't have, you know, look, I, of course, I think measuring public attitudes and maybe even ideological tremors are worthwhile, but it started to, I feel, become a bit of a fairy tale. Like, you know, just to be kind of brutal about it. If Bernie loses a state, well, it's lovely that 60% of the people want us to have a real health care plan, but we needed him to win the damn state. And what, where is the traction point between people's attitudes will change because the material conditions will add more pressure, somehow bridges, though, to those attitude changes are not good enough because... You know, as Amish, Amish Clark Cabral said, I you know paraphrase him like, look, people are fighting for their families and their futures, not ideas in their heads. Yeah, and that's, that's the meeting. You know, that's the rubber on the road. It's true. I mean, my my view of it is very similar to yours. Uh, I think this is an institutional question for the left. Because people can have as much uh, faith in our ideas as we want, and and look, that it's it, it, we shouldn't underestimate that. That's a great development. I mean, when of I course. first became active as a socialist you know the, the, our ideas were so far off the pitch um, and we've made incredible uh, progress uh, to develop a kind of new generation particularly of, of people who are critical of capitalism and, and are willing to imagine fundamental systemic alternatives not just patching up um, but we haven't managed to convince the people and particularly the class the working class um, that 
socialists have the answers to the problems uh, that they face, or at least that socialists can carry those answers out. So even where we've put forward policies that are individually popular, and if you look at Corbyn's situation in the December general election, it's not dissimilar to Bernie's situation now. You have huge numbers huge, uh, of, of you know support for key pillars, for planks of the Corbyn platform, the nationalisation of utilities, the kicking out of private interests from the National Health Service, um, the uh, expansion and the, the, the increase in the minimum wage and uh, like huge numbers of people supported uh, the most important economic parts of Corbyn's program but they didn't really believe it would happen they didn't believe that if you go and you voted for this uh, uh, party that this would happen and one of the reasons is uh, in my view anyway, that there's been this hollowing out of politics that's gone on for such a long time that people no longer have a belief uh, that you can change your life through uh, participating in politics, I mean, more profoundly through collective action, which is what we should be trying to convince people, but obviously, at least on the surface layer, through participating in politics. Um, because people have seen the neoliberalization of the state going back over such a long period of time, where uh, the idea was politics and economics were going to be... Uh, he froze. Uh, some kind of um, natural uh, sphere, uh, and then politics' role was to was to step out to the side of this, and and maybe it would make one or two kind of small changes around the edge, but that those two spheres should be kept separate. The market should do its thing, and politics should kind of only step in when there's exceptional circumstances. And so, to try to convince people, no, actually, you can now have uh, a vote to radically change your economic circumstances is a very difficult difficult thing to do uh, when people have such little faith in the political system. And I think that's one of the issues that we have to face. And it is an institutional question for the left. It's an institutional question because some of the reasons why we got our ass kicked are because our institutions haven't been strong enough. The media question is an obvious one, and both of us work in the media so we can address this immediately, right? Um, it, it's clear that we were not able to build institutions that were capable of reaching far enough outside of our left cul-de-sacs to influence working class people and the mass of society. And then faced with the reality of uh, the corporate media machine, particularly in your case, and in Britain, this kind of virulent right-wing tabloid press, uh, we were just steamrolled because we weren't able to get messages out, even ones that I think would have been very popular. And then you've got the question of things like uh, the unions and and the labor struggles. Well, neither, you know, there's been a bit more of an uptick in the United States, but you were starting from such a low base. Uh, there's been next to no uptick here over the last four and five years in, uh, in labor struggles, membership of the trade unions, days lost to strike action. You're talking fractions of what they were in the 70s and 80s. Um, and without rejuvenating the unions, we don't have a presence in people's day-to-day -day lives, in their working lives. And so, you know, the Sun and the Daily Mail and the tabloid press over here, they were present in people's day-to-day -day lives, but the Corbyn project really wasn't. And I think it's the same thing for, for, for Bernie. And it, then it goes on to the question of, of the party, too, which obviously is another one, and what our parties are meant to do. Here we had this civil war in the, the Labour Party, and actually it took a huge amount of energy out of the project of rebuilding a, a powerful working class party that would be present not only in Westminster and the kind of halls of politics, but again could be involved in community struggles and battles that affect people's day-to-day -day lives. And over there in the US, you've got a, another kind of question as regards the party, which is you've got a, a corporate democratic party, which is, uh, like, you know, developed really to to oppose working class interests from the start and which has very little space for uh, class politics uh, and then you've only got small organizations i mean bernie has millions of people who back him not only his uh, ideas but back the, the 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 prospect of a bernie sanders um presidency and yet you know your socialist parties the likes of the dsa of about 60 60 000 members or so i mean right. that we have to bridge gaps like that and i think it's going to be similar for us here keeping people in the party Party, um, in the Labour Party in the, in the longer term. Uh, these institutional questions, building up our, our institutional power, our social weight, our presence in people's day-to-day -day lives, that's the kind of stuff that convinces people to say, we don't just like the ideas, but we trust these people to carry them out. Yeah, in Germany, there's this phrase that the left used, uh, the, the sort of new left, and 
you know, it didn't necessarily culminate in the type of politics we would want, obviously, but set that aside. But the, the idea of the march through the institutions, that people who left um, the sort of student left in the 60s and 70s, and in Germany, way more than in Britain. I mean, obviously, Ireland's different, Northern Ireland's different, but, but Britain or the United States, you know, student movements and some protests and maybe occasionally some kind of like, you know, I don't know, baby formula air wants to try to bomb an army recruiter or whatever, sure. But in Germany, it was much more intense. There was actually like, you know, various factions that really did commit, you know, pretty sustained political violence um, right. and did have, and so it was, you know, a much more, Furbrile and a much more intense environment. And still, a lot of these folks decided, you know, the march through the institutions, and they framed it instead of selling out, it was the idea that the 68 generation would take political power, and they did. Now, the culmination of that project was their embrace of liberalism, which, you know, I, I think actually makes a lot of sense given the various trajectories. But we don't have an analog conversation i think about that on the left here and partially it's because institutions are so unresponsive but it seems to me that we need to at the very least have a frame of that kind of language like what does it mean to have an institutional base with even the baggage that that word carries for actually carrying out projects of power because i don't see it seems to me that that isn't just to use the example that everybody's obsessed with now, and I keep saying, and I, I shouldn't step on this landmine, but if you don't want to vote for the Democratic nominee, unless you have an institutional base to say that 7 million people won't do that either, and it will cost the election, and it is uniform regimented action. By the way, I would completely support that, because then I would sit down and I would dictate terms to the Democratic Party. If you don't have that, it's useless. It's all just signifying your feelings and that's fine but it doesn't have any upshot well, so what is our march through the institutions sorry you were talking a minute ago about the rent strike as well and i think this yeah. is it's a similar situation um because i i totally support the demand I, again you can see the obvious need for it in a context like now um but by comparison historically to when you know big rent strikes did happen and there was large housing action that took place in the 20th century you know it was undertaken in many cases in most cases by mass organizations and that gave people the sense of security to go and take actions like that without feeling that what was actually going to happen was that there would be you know a widespread uh anger Anger about the rent situation, but individuals who undertook action will be picked off one by one by one. And the only way for us to build that kind of new society is to give people uh, the sense of security in taking decisive action on, on behalf of uh, working class demands. And that requires institutions. And it requires institutional thinking. It also requires the question like now we're going to be talking a lot about the state, right? Because one of the ways in which uh, capitalism will respond to this crisis is with uh, the development of nationalizations, bailouts, uh, the question of what's going to happen with wages and, and so on. Obviously, for those who don't know, in, in Britain, you've had a situation where there's been a wage guarantee for those who are employed of up to 80% of, of their wages um, by the state. Uh, and a lot of workers have been left out of that. So where I was speaking earlier on about parts of the economy still going you know more precarious workers those who are classified as self-employed and so on have been left out of that so you've whole trades like the construction trade where the economy is, is keeping going um, but that is only a part of the discussion the other part is what are they going to do with things like the airline industry right uh, how are they going to deal with industries that are falling off a cliff and there's going to have to be some degree of buy-ins um, or a bit, you know bailouts may come but I think in the broader scheme here we're more likely to see buy-ins um, and we've got this big question, well, what do we do and say about this? Because obviously, you know, to some, to some degree over here, the policies that the Tory government are going to have to enact is going to make Jeremy Corbyn look like a Thatcherite, right? This crisis is going to get worse and worse. They're going to have to use the power of the state. And so what are our demands about that? And 
to have sensible demands, you have to have an institutional perspective. You have to understand that, you know, uh, when they talk about using the state, that there's a difference between a bailout and nationalization. Right? right. So we have to be arguing that we're going to take a stake in these strategically important companies. And then we have to argue that they're going to, we're going to do something with them. So instead of just allowing kind of nationalizations like we did see in the financial sector in 2008, that they're going to actually use those stakes for a social good, which means you probably need a controlling stake in those companies. In the, the likes of the airlines, what does that mean? Well, we need them to do something about the climate uh, targets that we have. We need to look at this as part of a more comprehensive approach to transport policy. So we need to be making demands now, understanding the institutional role of the state. And we need to understand, too, that it's very possible at this moment that there are two different trajectories. One, we're taking you know, things over on behalf of the state, nationalizing them, will have a lot of popular interest behind it. And the other, where the state is going to take increasingly authoritarian moves, uh, the prop up parts like the security state and so on, which are already growing in their strength. And those are things we have to be uh, against. So we have to be making the case for where there's nationalizations that they're going to be used in so for social good, and that there's going to be a democratization of the state, that there's going to be the state opening up uh, more to popular demands and popular participation and accountability, and not the other side, which is an increasingly hierarchized state of, uh, you know, security and authoritarianism and police and army powers, where, where you know, we can easily see if this crisis economically deepened, which it will, how that would get worse with each passing week and month and leave us in a, in a bad position. So, you know, institutional questions are essential to understanding where the left has to go in this decade. That was also why I was really trying to use, and we're going to try to more consciously, I want us to own the word democracy. I want us to understand that particularly in the United States, democracy probably in the UK to some extent as well, to maybe a large extent, is, you know, it's used in this kind of hokey, disingenuous way. And anybody who knows anything knows that we live in extraordinarily flawed and corrupted and live in the democracies and so on. But I want us to, to one, own the rhetoric of democracy as a substantive bridge to fight against the national security state, the civil liberty rollbacks, because the irony is, of course, that the base, and this actually, it goes back to a kind of classical Marxist understanding. The, the capacity to fight a workers' war in a mobilization sense, not literally, but in, in a industrial democracy to mobilize worker action is in no small part built on a foundation of actual substantive enlightenment style civil liberties. You can't, you know, get out of that right mm -hmm. and then the second thing that i think I, I wanted to just i think you just put it there really well yes there's some rhetorical you know it, yes we have to say look okay we can't afford anything bernie's doing but we've just summoned trillions of dollars like of course we have to explain how this shows what a lie that is but it seems to me that we it, we actually need to take seriously we are moving out of capitalism. There is a shrink in what the capitalist mode of production can do. And we are going to morph into something that is more, you know, either more democratic and socialistic, centralized where it needs to be, decentralized where it shouldn't be, or another form of, you know, a, a, an Amazon world that is hybridized with the government. And there's a systems of private and public control that surveil and monitor people and deliver them basic services. And so, you know, and, and that, that isn't necessary. I mean, it, it, there would be a, it wouldn't be capitalist either. And like, we're, we're fighting for something new and just the simple reality of there's a big government role and it's spending lots of money doesn't really prove anything. It could just mean we're morphing into the next wave of a highly militarized oligarchy. Yeah, I mean, my view on that is, I think the question for us 
is to move in a more socialist direction and a more democratic direction or towards state monopoly capitalism right where you're going to have um this concentration of power in the hands of a big and quite authoritarian state and uh the economy controlled substantially by monopolies uh, so you know this crisis sees the wiping out of um uh, of the kind of diversity in the ecosystem whatever way you want to put it of the uh, in the economy where you have small businesses and so on go um and uh, amazon and the giant corporations uh, simply become this uncontrollable monopoly um that organizing the entire um production and distribution of of goods uh, in the economy um that's the risk that's the 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 potential uh, downfall of this uh, period of time and if we lose this crisis like we lost the last one that's where we'll end up uh, and the other alternative is that we really have a moment now where we can make systemic uh criticisms and suggest alternatives and i'll give you one i mean i think in many ways this is an opportunity to do it this is a time to do it and it's yes. not uh, it's not um to look at this situation right um and say anything other than we have the answers that can stop this becoming a disaster with huge numbers of people dying that you know it's our version of public health care health care run in the interest of the people that has some chance of staving off the worst outcome here it's our idea of how society works that is reflected in what you need to do to respond to the pandemic right so you can't have uh, this you know Thatcher's idea there's no such thing as a society no we've all been exposed now to the reality that we're interconnected mutually dependent and that the uh, behavior of one person impacts directly on the outcomes of another person and that we all have to see ourselves as part of a collective to get through this and we have to be making that case that is the uh, philosophy that is the ideology that provides us with some degree of uh, of hope that we can overcome this situation without terrible tragedies uh, but we also have to look at what's happening on the economic side right so for such a long time we've had this market based economy where uh, you know anyone who's gone through ecom 101 will have seen the supply demand charts right and uh, but you know what did demand actually mean in that case demand you could have you know as many people your demand was basically right the the desire for something backed up by money if you had uh, a million people who were starving with no resources or means to pay for something it didn't show an inch on supply and demand curves because it was about demand was about your desire for something backed up by 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 money and that was the the fundamental uh, understanding of what undergirded the, the capitalist uh, system right that this was something that where production was to serve profit rather than for need and we now have a situation where all of a sudden the governments of the world are talking about production for need we're going to have to take over supply lines to make sure that people have enough food in this circumstance we're going to have to take over the production of uh, protective equipment and ventilators to make sure that uh, needs are met we're going to have to focus on need instead of on uh, people on the desire to to generate profits and that fundamental uh shift in the economy then we're beginning to see uh, happen raises the question of what the hell we were doing before why were we producing all of these things why were we structuring our entire economy around uh, a system that said things should be produced based on uh, their uh, ability to generate profits for the extraordinarily wealthy and the, the ruling class why were we not saying we need an economic system where things are produced based on social needs I think of you know London at the moment where they've managed now to use empty hotel rooms to house the the homeless right wow um, Right. For so for so many years, we were told these things were impossible. Homelessness, oh, it's just absolutely you know necessary. It's a, it's a natural. It's like the air you breathe. Well, no, it isn't. When you have an economy and a society where things are organised around need instead of organised around profit, you can do all kinds of things. The queues at the food banks, totally unnecessary. Child poverty, totally unnecessary. All of these things are the products of artificial economic constraints that have been placed on us uh, by a, a ruling class who wants. To to maintain a system where goods and services are produced for profit not for human need and we should say very clearly that this crisis shows how society should be organized and we shouldn't allow them to go back 
to uh, where things were beforehand. If they have taken over private hospitals, as they're going to, I'm sure, in this country, and they've begun to do in other countries like Ireland, where I'm originally from, those hospitals have to stay in public hands. Yes. If yes. they have nationalized uh, key sectors, strategic sectors of the economy, because uh, they uh, were couldn't survive without public and state support, well, then those have to stay in public hands and they have to be used for social ends. If we have greater protections that come down the line, whether it's wage uh, protections that have been negotiated in this country with the trade union movement, well, the trade union movement should be at the table negotiating wages from here onwards. We can't go back to a situation where the trade unions are written out of economic policy. No, there has to be sectoral collective bargaining and there has to be uh, an economic policy written um, with workers in mind. Those kind of questions are fundamental to this moment. They're necessary responses to save lives in a crisis, but they're also opening doors to a new system. Uh, one that has to come in this next decade, because what we're going to see is just how unsustainable this model is. Ronan Burton Shaw, you nailed it. Got it. The Lula of the Tribune right there. That was a great riff, brother. Thank you, man. No, for real. I think that's, and I think there should be no, we have to completely jettison any type of, you know, tactics or language or whatever that can alienate building a mass base. And then we need to combine that with being completely unapologetic like you just were. We can mobilize the economy for a completely different set of outcomes and that's it we need to do it but the homelessness is always unacceptable so i i can't i appreciate you immensely everybody subscribe to read tribune if you if you can um we we are subscribers to tribune it's an excellent resource and uh just ronan really appreciate you man thank you a pleasure to be on take care um that was great all right, uh, folks, we are going to get to Milton Alamadi shortly, but first we have to get to the gem. Yeah, so there's a lot to talk about, um, but I just want to frame a couple of things for people and actually, you know, continuing to build off of this theme of this episode and a lot of the project and the work that we've been doing. Uh, you know, the Federal Reserve is a major part of our economy, and the left really doesn't talk about or think about it enough until it does something big. Uh, and we're seeing that happening right now where the Federal Reserve has been actually engaging in market um, activities for the past few months, like significant ones. The, the repo crash early at the end of uh, 2019, for example, was a massive uh, push by the Fed to kind of like create more stability in the markets. And then obviously we're seeing what's happening now. I just wanted to take a second to sort of explain just what's happened over the past couple of days and give us a strategy going forward. Um, so basically, since this coronavirus uh, pandemic has started, the Federal Reserve has taken a very aggressive stand, and they're actually have basically engaged in almost all of their 2008, 2009 emergency uh, responses. So the Federal Reserve is actually out buying a significant amount of government-backed debt. Um, so that's treasuries, um, that is uh, government-backed mortgages, right? So that's a significant um role that it's already playing basically buying up uh, these debts but here's the thing that they've been doing recently that's unprecedented and it's something that we definitely need to be talking about it is now actually directly uh, loaning out to is directly buying corporate bonds so for people who don't understand the federal reserve it works with banks um, primarily, the way to think about it is it's the lender of last resort. If you're a major bank and you're short at the end of the day, you can go to the Federal Reserve um, to basically loan out the money that you need. And in extreme situations, um, need to make your the amount of money that you need to have cash on hand. Um, and in, in extreme situations, the Federal Reserve has taken these extra steps basically to shore up the market. Um, being buying you know debts or other financial products from banks to sort of allow them to stand on their own two feet now what the federal reserve is doing right now is actually going directly to corporations so before the federal reserve would shore up the financial system by going through the banks and then the banks you know you know in theory and, and in practice uh would then you know pass on those stimulus to corporations what's happening now is the federal reserve is going directly uh, to corporate America by buying corporate bonds. Why is this a problem? 
because the Federal Reserve basically is subverting Congress and subverting the U.S. government um, as the primary interaction for uh, its its relationship with corporate America. What's very frightening about this is as we're fighting for this bailout, right, and we're trying to get the best policies that we possibly can get, uh, the Federal Reserve is basically operating in a way that they're going to be buying these gov they're going to be buying these corporate bonds, um, basically giving influxes of cash uh, to these uh, corporations that need it. By the way, we're like we need to shore up the economy in this crisis uh, situation. But they're doing it in a way that is actually undermining the position of Congress, undermining the position of the federal government to impose its will on corporate America. So, you know, there's been a lot of talk about like, oh, well, if uh, the, so the Federal Reserve is buying these corporate bonds and the limits that they've put on corporations is very small. As long as uh, these corporations are for, <clears throat> As long as these corporations, uh, when these corporations are paying back their interest, and if they're foregoing their interest payments, which they would do initially, um, they are not allowed to use this money for stock buybacks, right? Right. Which is good on, on one level, but it's such a small piece of the pie. There's no provisions on stopping golden parachutes, you know, paying out the CEOs. There's no rules on bonuses. There's no rules on employee aid, making sure that you're not laying off huge amounts of your of your company during this crisis. Basically, they're allowing the the, the bond, the stockholders and the C-suite aspects of the corporations to thrive without making sure that everyday Americans, the employees in these corporations are safe. So people right. have the right to be very angry about the lack of democracy and the lack of transparency in the Fed actions. The fact is that the Federal Reserve made this decision on their own, right? They are not necessarily going through Congress or going even through the president. Um, to participate in these massive decisions in our society. People are absolutely right to see the Federal Reserve as a kind of mysterious institution. Um, and, and we should be demanding much more uh, democracy from that organization and also being more creative in how we can use it. I will say that when we see these numbers, you know, like $1.5 trillion being pumped into the financial sector while people are hearing, you know, that their neighbors, their family members themselves are very worried about being able to afford rent at the end of the month, being very worried about being able to afford food, they are very right to be angry. I want to make the, the point, though, that as long as we live in this system, and I don't think we should be living in this system, we are so connected to financial capital that if that system collapses, the crisis will get much worse. Right. We are so connected to that world uh, that we actually are connected to the profits of the super wealthy, not in a way that we benefit from it, but in a way that when their profits go down, we can be absolutely devastated. So, you know, there are some actions of the Federal Reserve we'll have to take in the context of the system that we are in. But we are not right. talking about preserving that system at all. And we actually need to start going beyond that. See, that's where a lot of liberals would go. There's like, oh, well, I don't really like this, but I know this has to happen. No, we should be saying there's no way that we're, our livelihood and our lives as people in this massive country should be held up by the profits of a very small group of this country. The fact is, is that the rich have too much power and they have too much control over our resources that when they are threatened, we are also... Um, we are we are also tied into their own profit that if their profit starts evaporating then we lose our jobs we lose our access to food we lose our access to credit right and we are saying that we want to break from that system so we need to be pushing for a large um, democratic push in the Federal Reserve. The fact is this, the Federal Reserve did something this week which is unprecedented. The Federal Reserve did something in 2008 that was unprecedented. We need to understand that politics is about power and institutions respond to power. The fact is, is that in our society, the power is so um, skewed towards the super wealthy and the elite that they bend the rules. They come up with new programs. I mean, the way that the Federal Reserve is couching this program, by the way, to buy corporate um, bonds, is very complicated because they know that technically they can't really do it, right? But they're finding a creative way to get around those rules. There's no reason that we cannot use these kind of financial mechanisms in the future um, to pursue left-wing radical goals. And we need to remember these when we are in power and control these institutions that we can use these for radical means. Here's the thing. 
We are living through another global crisis. This time it didn't begin in finance, but finance is certainly going to amplify and extend the crisis much further. We did not learn our lessons in 2008. We cannot do half measures. We need to make sure that we are empowering Congress and the people to, one, begin to start nationalizing some of these banks. Right, we need to have, yep. and if not full out nationalizations, we need to have massive stakes, and not kind of half ass stakes where uh, you know we just hold it for a couple of years and then you know we get a little bit of our investment back. No, we need to be owning these banks and force and making them work for the public good. The same goes for corporate America. There's no reason that we should not be starting to talk and putting this idea into people's heads about nationalization. Oil and gas companies are very cheap right now. We could be taking those over if we had an actual, we cared about climate change and doing something about the devastation that we're going to face in the short term and also in the long term. We need to be absolutely pushing to corporations to no longer look toward stockholders first and workers second. We have the power, we have the leverage, we have the ability to do it. The, diff the problem is, is that we have a government that is very much more, is much more interested in benefiting the wealthy in this country, and that goes for Republicans and Democrats, though it must be said that the GOP is heinous um, in their willingness to participate this, in this. And there is no populist pivot on the right. Mm. Bullshit. That's true. No, exactly. I mean, as much as Trump likes to talk, basically his whole bailout package has been about empowering the wealthiest. And basically what they're doing is they're using every tool in their in their arsenal to benefit the people at the top while the rest of us truly suffer. So we need to start being more radical and pushing back on these kind of uh, half-assed kind of uh, left liberal proposals too when it comes to these institutions and say, you know what, they break these rules all the time. We need to start saying that we have the ability and the power and we're going to build that power to start using these for radical methods because we need a radical solution. We're seeing the entire world collapsing around us right now. The reality is radical and it's time that we meet it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and again, I want to just really say to folks, um, you know, and we try to do it on the show, and I think David does a really, really good job with it. It's really important to read the financial pages. It's really important to both not be intimidated by the jargon and the terminology and the charts. That's the kind of social capital of intimidating people. Uh, get over that. You're all smart. You can understand things. And that's where the action is. I mean, you know, you, you got to, I mean, among multiple sites, but, you know, it's, it's like the Amber Frost actually had a great piece about why leftists can enjoy the Financial Times more than New York Times. <laughs> and among, you know, many other reasons, it was like, well, at least we all know we're actually on a battlefield. And yeah. it's also like you, you need to, you know, understand you know, how these dynamics are actually working. Do we have a uh, Milton? Okay, I'll, I'll see. I, we're I mean, to, yeah, go ahead. Just riffing on that too, you yeah. know, it's been a very interesting thing where the rich have been involved in politics directly over the past few decades for a very long time, especially in America. It was sort of seen as very unseemly for the rich and the wealthy bourgeoisie to be right. directly involved in politics because they always understood that, oh, we already have control of the institutions. You know, and that's just for, you know, upstarts basically to participate in it. And, and we need to start to have that, that um, attitude basically is that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's going on behind the scenes um, that's just as important as the kind of political battles that are going on on CNN. Right. You know, it's it's also, uh, well, look, if you took a couple thousand, if you took jobs because you needed a job and you wanted to just like sabotage Bloomberg's campaign and vote for Bernie, I feel terrible for you. Mm -hmm. um, if you are just some like mega hack asshole who actually likes Bloomberg, <laughs> ha, 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 ha. Ha ha ha. For ha, sure. ha 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 ha. You're not staying on till November. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. The money's going to the DNC. Just speaking of these people, like like what world do we live in that Mike Bloomberg actually held political office? You know, like mm -hmm. uh, it's just unbelievable. I texted him. Um, did you follow him up with an email, Matt? Yeah, send him another one. Oh, there he oh, boom. There he is. Speak of the man himself. Milton, we were wondering where you were. 
Oh, you're connecting audio. Okay. How oh, nice. Connecting audio. <laughs> it's very. It's very exciting. <laughs> it is exciting. <laughs> the suspense of waiting for the great Milton Alamadi. He is the publisher of Black Star News. He's also professor at John Jay College. He hosts a fantastic program on WBAI, uh, and he's also the author of many books, and as well as a frequent appearer on TMBS and other outlets. Milton Alamadi, how are you? I'm good. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks for having me back on your show. Can you see me? My apartment is so dark. <laughs> <laughs> we can see you, man. We can see you. Everything we can see. I assure you. I assure you I'm here, man. <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing, How are you man? holding up? Uh, uh, listen, how are you? I have a lot of books, you know? Now I'm always posting books when I buy books on my Facebook page, right? Yes. Well, now now I'm enjoying those books, man. Right? What are you reading? Uh, I'm reading um, A History of Ethiopia by uh, Harold Marcus, because I want to really write something on Ethiopia. What's interesting you about Ethiopia right now? Okay, what interests me the most is actually the history of Ethiopia. Ethiopia was the only African country that was not colonized because when Italy tried to invade in 1896 to colonize, the Italian army, the imperial army, was defeated at the Battle of Adwa by Emperor Menelik II and his wife, Empress Tetu. That's a story that needs to be made into a movie, I'm telling you. Mm. Maybe, you know, at some point... So I want to write that book. I want to get the interest out, and let's see what happens. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And maybe you should write a screenplay. Hello, can you hear me? Too. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? We, we can hear you loud yes. and clear. I think yes, now I can. I think there's just a little delay, so maybe just wait oh, okay. like 10 seconds. But okay, we actually... <laughs> yeah, we hear you well. Um, okay. Let me start with this, Milton. Uh we are obviously dealing with this global pandemic. It affects, yeah. it's the classic, I mean, there's a lot of lessons in it on so many levels, but it affects and threatens everybody in the globe and then each in their own particulars. And I would like you to talk very specifically. We speak in general terms, we've spoken in general terms about how the World Bank, IMF, financial systems, backed by the U.S. dollar, I think ultimately backed, as Daniel Bestner would talk about, by nuclear bombs, by like the actual power <laughs> in military terms, but uh, of the United States, that the World Bank and IMF kept on the colonial agenda uh, in Africa, basically just making it uh, you know, underdeveloped, safe for capital, international capital. Typically, right. as we're in the pandemic age, what to this day to this day, has the World Bank and IMF structural adjustment packages and financial mandates that still are active in uh, the continent today and, of course, across the world, what have they done, um, along with anything else, local mistakes, mismanagement, foreign direct investment, right. to Africa's health systems? Right. Well, okay, there's so many, so many levels. So I'll touch upon a few, and then you go. We can revisit it. If I missed out some points, just prompt me along. But this is how I would start. Look at the difference between African countries and Cuba. Just think about that. Ponder that for a little bit. How is it that a tiny country like Cuba is always going to the rescue of Africa, a continent of 1.3 billion people today. Think about that. 54 countries with all these presidents, vast natural resources. But when Ebola struck, guess who it was that went to Africa's rescue? It was Cuba. Cuba sent hundreds of doctors, hundreds of healthcare workers. Cuba bailed out African countries because African countries are so disjointed that they could not even coordinate a plan and say, we can do this by ourselves. 
We have 54 countries with 54 national armies. And I, I, I point out the armies because the militaries are normally the best financed and equipped organizations in African countries. Forget it, not teachers, not doctors, not hospitals, but the military. But they couldn't even say, let's deploy our military to the three West African countries that are most struck by Ebola. They couldn't do that. Why? Because their military are so busy suppressing, repressing, and torturing their own citizens. They don't have the mindset that it would take <laughs> to go and help other Africans in distress. So it took tiny Cuba to control and eradicate Ebola in Africa. Let me give you a second example. Cuba had to deploy thousands of soldiers and lost as many as 10,000 Cuban soldiers in order to liberate Southern Africa. Had it not been for Cuban soldiers and Cuban equipment, and because Castro was actually the commander-in-chief who was actually directing the battle from Cuba. From Cuba. UNITA would have ended up being in power in Angola. And UNITA, of course, was a CIA-funded and a South African-funded reactionary organization, which means Namibia would not have been liberated when it was, which means South Africa would have been liberated much, much later. And who knows? Nelson Mandela might have died in prison because it took Cuba to defeat South Africa's army at the Battle of Quito Cuadraval in Angola in 1987-88 for South Africa to realize that it could actually be defeated militarily. And it withdrew from Angola. And it withdrew from Namibia. And it went back home, and two years later, <laughs> Nelson Mandela was released. It was not because of a change of heart. It was because of the defeat they suffered at the hands of Cuba. They realized that Cuba could actually, in coordination with other African countries, invade South Africa itself and affect a military solution to end apartheid in South Africa, which, by the way, there are many people who say it might not have bad, been a bad solution because more than a quarter century after the defeat of formal apartheid, all the structures of economic apartheid still exist in South Africa. So that the white minority, less than 8%, controls more than 72% of the land. But that's another story altogether. Mm -hmm. And I bring all this to say that because the World Bank model is the anti-Cuba model. So, so, so African countries have not been able to do anything that Cuba has been able to accomplish, even with its limited resources, because the World Bank model of neoliberalism would not comport with that. In order to access World Bank financing, as you know, there are what they call conditionalities. And part of the conditionalities include you cannot subsidize local industries, which, in fact, everybody that knows any history knows that every country that industrialized was because of a partnership between the state and the private sector. There's no country that industrialized on its own. Britain plundered from the rest of the world and was able to use that accumulated capital to industrialize. And then after the Industrial Revolution in Britain, it spread to other parts of the world, including parts of Western Europe and the United States. In the United States, of course, we know the capital accumulated by enslaved labor of Africans enabled the U.S. to industrialize. And that's what you call a partnership <laughs> of the state and private sector. Uh, South Korea, the same thing. Those companies were not really Companies, those were state enterprises. And in South Korea, the United States wanted to send an example to North Korea that this is what you're missing. So it was an artificially created um, industrialization. It was not spontaneous or organic in any way or form. The U.S. opened up its markets to South Korean products. That is why South Korea is South Korea, 
and North Korea is North Korea. So to bring this up at a sort of myth that you can industrialize without a partnership, not in fact in being driven by government itself. Even in the contemporary era, the United States is always being got just hold on one second, Milton Milton. I'm sorry, you're really cutting out, Thank at you. least for me. Sorry. Are we okay, Matt? Should we try again or um we've been good up until just the last I can't like, hear 30... you. Oh, sorry, one second. Matt. Yep, here I am. Here I can hear you. Can here you... Yeah, we yeah. were good until the last about 30 seconds there. So uh, I don't know. All right. Let, yeah. Oh, just sorry, Milton. Just just go go ahead. The only reason I interrupt, it, it's okay. It's a little choppy. I just literally couldn't hear what you were saying. So just go back ahead. Oh, no, sorry. I appreciate that. I, I don't want to be speaking for the record. So please, whenever you need to intercede, let me know. Okay. So where was I? In terms of, uh, okay, so it's quite clear. It's impossible to industrialize without a partnership. I think I think we need to I think we need to I think we need to get Milton back on with another. Okay. Yeah, just leave and then click the same link and come right back. I don't know if you're hearing us, but. I think you he heard us. Okay, okay, good. Oh man. Okay. Yeah, hopefully. He was on fire though. He yeah. was on I it's so fucking frustrating to not have that all get through cuz this is I'm sorry David, but they're gems. <laughs> I don't have a trademark on it. <laughs> <laughs> You actually put a, a, a request at the U.S. Patent Office. It'd be that really funny, actually. Extremely aggressive. For like, uh... <laughs> like I like, do the gem. <laughs> <laughs> it's my intellectual property. All right, hopefully, this is going to be stronger. Oh yeah. I'm... But he just so perfectly weaves all of the things together that we need to weave, and we do need that global consciousness about it for sure yeah i mean just like if i guess if we have a single oh there we go let's see praying that this works i'm sure it will it'll take him a little bit to get caught up yeah it'll take a sec we were just singing his praises so hopefully he will hear us singing his praises while the audio is connecting um We've got a Milton. Yes, hi. Oh, okay, great, great, can, great. All right, I can't see, I cannot see uh, Michael. I can see, uh, yes, okay, I can see somebody now, not Michael. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're great. So, Milton, just keep going. You were talking about South Korea and how right. development happens. So, just you're on fire. Just keep going. Okay. Okay, good. And then I said, for example, we see the United States is always arguing with China, right? Now, are those private entities arguing? No, of course not. It's the United States government arguing with the Chinese government because the U.S. is the number one guarantor of private enterprise in the United States. And the same thing for China in China. So all this World Bank nonsense going around, around the world <laughs> Treating to weak African countries, that you need to allow private enterprise to take the leading role. It is absolute nonsense. It would not survive in the United States. It would not survive anywhere else in the industrialized world. So why is that being preached to African countries? That's because of their position of weakness. All right, so that, that, that's in terms of industrialization. Then the other aspect is privatization, right? Privatization, 20%. Today, it's like 97%. And this is how China has been able to modernize and build a modern industrialized society. Look, not, a many, not many people are aware, and few might not even believe this, but in 1959, the per capita income of Ghana was double that of China, believe it or not. But what has happened? Uh, in, in the in, in, interim period. China, of course, kicked out all the Western countries that were exploiting their resources, uh, uh, applying dope 
to uh, to to China yeah. and, and, and and took control of its resources and its political affairs. Now anybody can say whatever they want about the Chinese political system. Yes, we can debate that, but nobody can deny that China has transformed itself from a backward rural peasant society into a country that is today a superpower. And Africa has perhaps much more resources than China does. But what Africa lacks is the political structure that would allow it to set its own political and its own economic agenda. And that makes a vast difference. Anybody can say whatever they want about the United States system. But at least the people that are elected to manage the affairs of this country, their number one concern is the United States, often to the detriment to the rest of the world, and in terms of the elite that actually govern, <laughs> often yeah, to the detriment. I, I, I think how they're defining United States is very, 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 very narrow. And I, I actually do think- Oh, we, no, I was gonna add, yeah, I was yeah, going yeah. to add, I was yeah. going to add that often to the detriment of right. the majority of the right. citizens yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of the United States. Right. You see? Right, 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 right. So but what we have in Africa are people who literally are elitist so long as their own narrow interests are satisfied, they have total disregard for the rest of the population. And there's a book that I always talk about when I ever get on programs like this, and it's Nkrumah's neo-colonialism, the last stage of imperialism. And what I like about this book is if people don't have time to read the entire 200 plus pages, the introduction alone, which is about 12 pages, really summarizes his thesis brilliantly. And he says, think about this. If the individual governments in African countries don't owe their positions in power to the domestic uh, constituency, to the voters, why should they care? Think about that. If all you need to do is satisfy the needs of a former colonial power, like Britain or France, or the new superpower, the United States became the new superpower in Africa in the 1960s, after it became clear that the former colonial powers had run out of money, Britain was bankrupt, France was bankrupt, that, that was the era of the US ascendancy. But nonetheless, his bigger point is this. If you are dependent on those outside powers for your regime, why should you care about the needs of your citizens? That question, when he posed that question, when he wrote the book in 1965, is still relevant today in the 21st century. So for example, a country like Uganda, why should General Museveni <laughs> care? about what Ugandans think about him. When he knows that, all he has to do is do a few things. Open up the, open up the industries, open up the resources to Western companies, uh, Britain, United States, deploy Ugandan soldiers to Somalia and tell the United States that yes, you are afraid of Shabab, Al Shabab. You, uh, you're afraid they're linked with Al-Qaeda. You're afraid eventually they'll become powerful enough to strike at continental US. I will do the police work for you. I will deploy Ugandan soldiers there. Right. If you, a person like Museveni, presents a deal like that to the US, think about that. He can be in power for as long as he wants. And that's why he's been in power in Uganda for 34 years. Well, the schools have collapsed, the hospitals have collapsed, the roads have collapsed, and you have this being done while the World Bank is condoning this kind of activity and continuing to lend money to countries like Uganda. It's a nightmare scenario. And I think the only way it can actually end is if the youth of Africa do away not only with the current leadership in Africa, but the entire structure uh, of how government is managed in Africa and how they manage their affairs and the economy vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the industrialized world. Milton, in the last like little uh, section here, I want to ask you specifically, and we're going to start talking about this a lot more on the show, 
But last April uh, in Beijing, leaders gathered together uh, with Xi Jinping and uh, they celebrated what was then in April 2019, the second year anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative. And basically, right. Belt and Road is this, just to let people know a bit, it's this enormous infrastructure project, uh, an economic project headed by the Chinese that will essentially connect Africa through the old Silk Road routes, uh, Central Asia, uh, key parts of Europe. It has major geostrategic implications for Africa. Um, yes. And I just want to get your sense of it. What do you think? Is this a generally positive initiative for Africa or no? Right. Okay. In the short term, it actually is not because it oh. continues it continues exploiting Africa's resources by acquiring resources from Africa and taking it to to fuel uh, China's uh, industrialization and growth and creating wealth in China in the short term. But in the long term, it actually will benefit African countries because what China has been doing, which the U.S has not been doing, Britain has not been doing, France has not been doing, is building infrastructure in African countries, roads, bridges, tunnels, railways. China built a rail linking Ethiopia to Djibouti on the coast at a cost of $4.5 billion. You don't hear that kind of investment coming from a Western country in Africa. China built a rail linking the western part of Kenya all the way through Nairobi to the coast in Mombasa. I think that project was worth $1.6 billion. China has built billions of dollars worth of infrastructure in other African countries, and in Ethiopia in particular, and in West African countries, in Angola, resource-rich uh, countries like that. Now, why do I say it's going to bear fruit, not only for China, but for Africa in the long run? Because as the old colonial powers have been sleeping and the new colonial power, which the United States is in Africa, has also been sleeping, China has been thinking, China has been playing the long game. So what do I mean by that? This year in July, what's called the Africa Continental Free Trade Area is going to be launched. 54 African countries have already signed and ratified the agreement, which means it's going to be one of the largest free trade zones anywhere in the world. It's going to reduce barriers. That's what they're going to start with, eliminating barriers. It's going to boost intra-Africa trade, which right now is only by 20%. If you compare with Europe, intra-European trade is about 70%. So it's going to lower the cost of doing trade. And of course, since China is already a player in more than 40 African countries, it means China is going to benefit from this increased intra-African trade. So that's why I say it's going to play, it benefit both China and Africa in the long run. And for Africa, it's going to do another thing as well. It's going to allow African countries, and now collectively, to increase their bargaining power with the West. Because now with a huge free, free trade zone, they're going to be able to say, if you want to enter this market, well, we have some demands as well. <laughs> so that's going to be, even the World Bank referred to it as a potential game changer. Does this, as a final uh, thought, does this, uh, you're, you've also talked a lot about in uh, the work of Samir Amin, does this link to yes. his idea of, yeah, yeah, could you elaborate on that? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, because it's Samir Min, who died a few years ago, uh, was, I think, one of my favorite economists, actually, and African intellectuals. His argument was that you can be, you can have industries without industrializing, which means you're actually a subcontractor for Western companies. In order for you to really industrialize, you have to have an integrated economic system meaning you use your domestic raw material for your domestic factories. And these factories supply products to other factories. Others are for input and others for, for output. So it's integrated. And that's what the uh, Africa uh, uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement 
may eventually allow, allow African countries to do. And do you, I always have to ask this now, because these power imbalances and dealing with capitalism in so many different ways, whether we're talking about actually the late stage rot in the kind of imperial core or the ongoing exploitation of Africa, multipolarity, all of these things. What though, where is the ecological dimension in all of this? Because we also know, yeah, where is that? Thank you for asking that. Um, Increasingly, uh, African activists are becoming much more conscious when it comes on the environment because they see what is happening in other parts of the world. And I'm happy to say that this is also to be going to be a major uh, role that the uh, 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 Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement will be addressing. So yes, absolutely. As you know, in the past, African countries were dumping ground for toxic, toxic uh, materials that could not be disposed of in the West. All they had to do was give a few million dollars to some corrupt leader, and they would allow this toxic waste to actually be shipped <laughs> and dumped in some African countries. I know it happened in some West African countries. I know it used to happen in Somalia on the East Coast. So that will no longer be tolerated once the uh, Africa free trade continental uh, area becomes effective. Milton Alamadi, we treasure you, we honor you. Uh, you're one of our mentors and guides and uh, please stay safe and healthy. Oh, and we'll same s- to you, same to all yeah. of you. And I'm always <laughs> delighted to be on your show. I'm sorry we can't do it in the studio, but oh, I look man. forward Me too. <laughs> to normalcy. Me too. I look Stay strong, to, all of you. Stay, stay healthy. strong, and I look for I look forward to the normalcy of you in the studio and and us uh, getting our our uh, occasional uh, tea and coffee together too. And so, thanks. thank you, Carmen. I have to add one other thing. One other Please. thing before you run. Please. Cuba is now deploying Cuban doctors and healthcare workers to Italy. Okay. We're going to be talking about about that in the post game. (laughs) It's about time that somebody says, thank you, Cuba. (laughs) Thank you, Cuba. (laughs) Yeah. Cuba is a heroic country. Oh, yeah. Absolutely heroic country. Thank Thank you so much. Stay well. Thank you, Cuba. Thank you, Milton. Have a good one, Milton. See you. Everybody, please go follow Milton Alamadi. Find all of his work. It's just. I learned so much from Milton. Yeah. And it's always such an honor having him on the show. Um, so, uh, folks, uh, uh, okay, we have to get to actually this Trump uh, press conference. I want to do that in the main part of the show. Um, if M- Milton, you can leave the meeting if you want. I think that's how it works. Um, just so he doesn't feel, because I don't want him to think that he has to stay on till a break or something. Can you, uh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah, because I don't want him to feel stuck. That would suck. Mm-hmm. To, uh, maybe the frame is just frozen. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. But I've, I've been, uh, yeah, I don't like that when you're like, yeah, like you feel like you have to stare at the screen for a couple of minutes. Um, so, uh, Molly, look, we've been we we just give you guys so much nutrition. It's a this is this is pretty bone dense. Uh, hopefully, still also fun content. So let me just remind everybody, you know, Rand Paul has Corona. Just <laughs> <laughs> try to lighten the mood a little bit. <laughs> Did you hear the follow up to that story? <laughs> no, that he that, still has it. <laughs> well, that his staffers like didn't know that he tested positive. <laughs> And, or oh like God. was getting tested. No. He is living his brand, man. He's that guy's literally he like really are so selfish. Could murder <laughs> his staffer's grandparents. He went swimming in the Senate pool while waiting test results. Like it's so evil, though. Man. I have I have no symptoms, and I'm like terrified of like seeing family members. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> Yeah, I'm thinking about like some like old person in the building like getting it, and I'm be like, I hope to God I didn't like bring that in from the grocery store. Rand Paul's like, <laughs> pool's a little bit cold today. Yeah, I was just waiting. I don't know. I'm gonna blow off some steam, do a few laps. 
<laughs> oh man, this is a whole other time. I mean, a lot of people have been pointing out like one can only imagine what drove Rand Paul's poor neighbor. <laughs> could you imagine i mean th isn't it basically confirmed it's just because Rand paul's an asshole <laughs> yeah i think you're right right it is, it's confirmed he's a fucking asshole he's an absolute pain in the ass uh so oh my god all right i just want to uh go over this a little bit yesterday donald trump gave a press conference and it is a disaster um on any number of levels because he is the culmination of this logic, right? Like he is the culmination of capitalist logic. Let's just get back to work. Let's just get back to work. And it should always be reminded, Thomas Friedman's putting out the upmarket version of this. This is the new message you're gonna see on Fox. Tucker Carlson was absolutely I'm sure the reason who uh, reason why Trump took this seriously to begin with, but he's the one who hosted the lieutenant governor of Texas inviting baby boomers to kill themselves. Yeah, Dan Patrick is such a chicken yeah. shit, by the way. Just like another one of these guys uh, who's like moves to Texas and then like tries to play up his cowboy credentials in a ridiculous. Where's he from? He's from Baltimore. Get the fuck out of here. You know, a lot of those guys aren't from Texas. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's a thing. It's like there's such a, like, I don't know, myth that they feel like they have to, like, double down on being a real asshole. <laughs> That's what I love is that all of these guys who run around being like, I'm from Texas, they are, like, the exact same person who, like, <laughs> moved to New York from, yeah. like, Prioria and was just like, I do ought. Exactly. You know, like, the annoy, like, just not to, like... And by the way, like that's what everybody does. So it's not like a judgment on anybody oh, per se. It's just like the idea that Texas is like, it's just like, yeah, you're play acting like everybody else. It's just you've decided to pretend to be are... like salt of the earth, like rugged cowboy shit. Well, that's what I say. The problem is when a lot of people start pretending, then you start to get a critical mass where it starts to become reality, right? And that's the... yeah, yeah, that's the truth. Well, we'll play. We should. We should play that in the post game. So yeah. here's uh, so basically Donald Trump is freaking out because even though he's getting good poll numbers on handling the crisis because we don't have an opposition party in this country, he recognizes that something in the atmosphere of this threatens his reelection chances. So it's time to get the show back on the road. Let's play um, the first. We do we have the one where he compares it to car accidents. Uh, we needed to get that one. Um, I have. Um, I, I only have the three that you sent me. Okay, I thought I thought we were going to find the car accidents one, guys. Um, yeah, I, we said that in the beginning. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on the Axios. Yeah, it's in. It's under Gem. So just put that up okay, on I screen. Got it, I got it. Just one second. Sorry. All right. Yeah. No problem. Just we'll play this. Oh, man. All right. This is Donald Trump uh, flanked by Bill Barr uh, saying this. And then we have a few more we'll get to. But this is the kind of key message here from this absolutely psychopathic, craven press conference. That's a great definition. And I will say we're going to be watching our senior citizens very closely. We're going to be watching uh, certain hotspots like New York. And within New York, you have areas which are troubling, and we'll be working with the governor and the mayor and everybody else on those spots. Uh, but at the same time, at a certain point, we have to get open and we have to be, uh, we have to get moving. We don't want to lose these companies. We don't want to lose these workers. We want to take care of our workers. So we'll be doing something, uh, I think, relatively quickly, but we've learned a lot during this period. This was a very necessary period. Uh, tremendous information was gained. But we can do two things at one time. You know, and again, I say we have uh, a very active flu season, more active than most. It's looking like it's heading to 50,000 or more deaths, deaths, not cases, 50,000 deaths, uh, which is, uh, that's a lot. 
and uh, you look at uh, automobile accidents, which are far greater than any numbers we're talking about, that doesn't mean we're going to tell everybody no more driving of cars. So we, we have to do things uh, to get our country open. But this has been an incredible period of learning, and we'll have announcements over the next uh, fairly short period as to the timing. John, please. So let's just be really clear again and again and again to Donald Trump, to Steve Mnuchin, to Nancy Pelosi, to Chuck Schumer, to Thomas Friedman. Everybody can socially isolate for six months, 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 months. Let's just take another. Let's say for six months nationally, not a lockdown, but just a strongly enforced social protocol. People basically stay indoors. There isn't a lot of, there's almost no air travel. There is serious measures taken in place. Send everybody a $2,000 a month, $3,000 a month check, stop rent, and massively subsidize small businesses. And of course, give everybody health care, get the emergency delivery, and then the bigger thing that we need to do, we need to nationalize and take democratic ownership of strategic industries. The point is, is not that those things are on the table. The point is, is that the answer is there. This goes back to the MMT thing the other day. And MMT is part of the answer. MMT has great ideas for this because we need a massive people-centered stimulus. But we know the answer to this. The reason it won't happen is because we live in a profoundly corrupt um, and psychopathic engendering society. Like Donald Trump is psychopathic. And it's unfortunate that the whole resistance scene has constantly been so melodramatic and freaks out over every single thing, including the things that are funny or the mm -hmm. things when he halfway has a point. By the way, this is one that's going to be really dangerous because if the frame for people is the choice is either self-isolate and starve and the economy collapses and the government will do nothing for people, they are going to gravitate towards his message because there's no obvious alternative. What are you going to tell people who can't work? Lights are going to go out. Evictions are going to come in. None of those monstrosities, you know, of course, the good people, the Bernie Sanders, the Rashida Talibs, they're fighting, but the Democratic leadership is not doing much. Um, and mainly, you know, this bailout has some decent provisions, but of course, it's a giant corporate theft and Steve Mnuchin slush fund. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is that, yes, we all know that what Donald Trump is pushing for is immoral, psychopathic, dangerous. We'll make the problem worse because as hospitals totally overflow from us not taking this seriously, it will prolong the shocks to the system. It will engender the authoritarian responses. And you see that ghoul, profoundly dangerous Bill Barr uh, standing there. I will just say, and maybe people should tweet at President Trump, I don't know why Bill Barr looks so unprofessional while Donald Trump is talking. I think that's pretty disrespectful. And even though I don't like Donald Trump, I still think obviously his attorney general should both look the part and treat him with, with respect. Bill Barr looks like a slob and is not treating him with respect there. And I think Donald Trump should know that. So um, that's like the big picture that just needs to keep getting hammered and hammered and hammered. Trump is a psycho. It's totally dangerous, but it's the only reason there's an opening for this is a systemic flaw. And the only people that are providing and putting for answers are people who are the Purdue workers going on strike and those of us engaging in spontaneous mutual aid and solidarity. And at a national level, Bernie Sanders, Ilan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, AOC, and, in, and at certain points, handfuls of others, and on a state level, uh, Giannaris in New York and others pushing for things like rent freezes. You gotta call these people. You gotta demand more. And I will say the last thing real quick, somebody till, today told me like, they called their senator, left a voicemail, and got a call back from their office. Like, you should not be in total futility. They mm -hmm. feel anxiety too. So that's one part that we gotta get to here. But David, go ahead. I just want to add, um, you know, talking about those kind of just like death drive comments by Donald Trump and going back to what Dan Patrick was saying, you know, we could get into a situation, um, which Jesus Christ, I mean, it's hard to have any certainty in this moment, but even two days ago, I thought was impossible, which is that we might actually have the federal government, uh, you know, through Donald Trump and then a lot of state governments actually telling people to go back to work when they shouldn't. And if that's the case, 
um, we actually have to start taking the power into our own hands. So what the people did, the Purdue workers uh, did in Georgia is exactly the kind of thing that we will need to be seeing because if they start trying to make this crisis um, become a catastrophe, become something that's going to kill literally millions of people. If they literally millions of people. Spread of this, um, we might actually have to have you know, more radical solutions where people just are not showing up to work on purpose, recognizing you know that they are you know threatened by that, but actually doing it as a collective, as groups, as they did in, in Georgia, to challenge this uh, power structure. Because especially in these right-wing uh, southern states, Republican states, uh, the response has been very slow and tepid. And I'm sure that they're already preparing and hoping that they can make the argument, oh, you know what, we should all go back to work and just act as if everything's normal. That's a death sentence for working class people. And we need to make it very clear to people that that's the decision. And we need to make sure that we're organizing to have this fight because we might have to have it very soon. 100%. And we need to start thinking of the mechanisms to give each other aid in that. All right, one more clip from the press conference. Uh, we won't get to all of them, but I want to go to this one from Own News. Um, uh, it, so basically, as we all know, Donald Trump insists on calling it the Chinese virus. Now, I think that there's a couple of different things to tease out here. There is a global war of perception going on between China and the United States. Uh, Premier Xi calls the virus a foreign devil. And one of the narratives in China is that this is the result of uh, U.S. bioweapons experiments, uh, as an example. Um, Donald Trump is obviously calling it a Chinese virus to double down on the xenophobic narrative in the United States. There's an international dimension. Uh, then there's the practical reality that a literal, like a virus is not a, you know, is not of a country or people that is just scientifically ridiculous and flies in the face of all of the actual international and global coordination required to deal with this. And then, frankly, most importantly, there's a lot of other things to tease out in the geopolitics. I don't think that there is a one-to-one -one relationship behind rhetoric and action. Um, and I think that, you know, there's obviously a million other factors in place here uh, in terms of uh, hate crimes and xenophobia in the United States. But Donald Trump is producing an environment where we are seeing constant reports of Asian Americans talking about being harassed, terrorized on the street, um, bizarre and ridiculous paranoia about food from Asian markets and things like that. And that's what he is feeding every time he calls it a Chinese virus. That's the bottom line and the reason it needs to be clearly rejected. He got a question, and this is very good, uh, you know, this is classic kind of like silly dummy right wing framing here from uh, O. O A N N, which I'm not even, I don't even know which one that is. That's right the now. One America, America News yeah. Network. It's very yeah. much the new Fox News, if you must know. Yeah, Indeed. Fox News is too squishy liberal for you. All right, I'll get it up. All right, let's play this. Do you consider the term Chinese? O A N. Yes, sir. <laughs> very good. Thank you very questions. much. Um, you treat me very nicely. Do Go you ahead. consider the term Chinese food racist because no. it's food that originates in China or it has Chinese? No, I don't think it's and racist. Note, I don't think it's racist at all. On that note, major left-wing news media, even in this room, have teamed up with Chinese Communist Party narratives, and they're claiming you are racist for making these claims about Chinese virus. Is it alarming that major media players just to oppose you are consistently siding with foreign state propaganda, Islamic radicals, and Latin gangs and cartels, and they work right here at the White House with direct access to you and your team? It amazes me when I read the things that I read. It amazes me when I read the Wall Street Journal, which is always so negative. Uh, it amazes me when I read the New York Times is not even, I don't, I barely read it. You know, we don't distribute it in the White House anymore. And the same thing with the Washington Post. Uh, because, you see, I know the truth. And people out there in the world, they really don't know the truth. They don't know what it is. Uh, they use different slogans and different concepts for me almost every week, trying to catch something. Last week, it was all oh, chaos. You see me. I, there's no chaos. I have no chaos. I'm the one telling everybody to be calm. There's no chaos at the White House. We have unbelievable professionals. <laughs> it's really, I mean, I think I came up with the term. I hope I came up with the term. But it is fake news. It's more than fake news. It's corrupt news. Uh, they write stories without calling anybody. 
they write a story uh, today. Uh, I had a couple of stories where they, they never call me, ever, that I know of. At least nobody tells me. Uh, they'll write a story about me without even asking my opinion on something. It's totally fake. Totally I've fake. never seen. I mean, there is a story in the Wall Street Journal today about, uh, you know, about right. how we've done. We've done a phenomenal job. We can't. This. We can't take more of this. Okay. So here's here's the bottom line. Number one, any, and this is really basic stuff. George W. Bush launched a global war that killed millions of people, Afghanistan, Iraq. It, it had a torture program, and it, it was the crea and a creation of a mass surveillance state that targeted plenty of people, obviously disproportionately Muslims. And he came out on TV regularly and basically said, like, don't be assholes to your neighbors, okay? So we're talking on that level. You can make any geopolitical point you want. I'm not making a value judgment on it. And you make very clear um, that you treat your neighbors with respect and dignity. He's not doing that. And that's really honestly as simple as it is. This is not like, this is not an elaborate argument you need to get into any sort of depth with. The second thing is that I said a couple of weeks ago, I've, I, I thought there was a minute where the body blow of this and Trump's negligence would actually hit him. But the Democrats are a failed party in their leadership and Trump is out in front of everything. And so he, he's in mid-50 approval ratings, and you already see the story there. You're going to link it with narratives, uh, you know, every wheel of xenophobia and conspiracy theory. Third, uh, you know, that's why the Middle East and Latin America are mentioned. Third, I mean, I guess it's so, it's so obvious, but it's like, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, French food is different than French disease. <laughs> like, I think anybody can oh understand the distinction and rhetorical framing there. And, you know, fourth, um, I think we can actually just keep this on like extremely simple terms like this. It does not require um, a whole lot more than that, even in terms of like, I mean, this is a good example of like not going in necessarily into like, bigger frames this is about anti-racism it's about your neighbors it's about safety and it's about what you're using a national bully pulpit for and you could even frankly in this one extremely discreet and concrete sense use the george w bush example to counter what he's doing and it's important because it's dangerous as hell and people are getting victimized because of it it's fucking disgusting asian americans are getting victimized because of it mm -hmm. Um, you guys have anything uh, you want to add to that? I mean, you know, it's definitely something we have to push back against. I, I don't think that it's um, worth really honestly tolerating any equivocating on this. He, this is definitely being used um, to, he's using racism to hide his absolute failure at dealing with this crisis. It's very frightening, obviously, that Donald Trump is the one sort of at the helm in this moment not only these kind of racist attacks, but just promoting like really fake medical advice too, uh, deadly fake medical advice right. actually. I don't believe anything that he's saying on, on these levels because he's, he's completely, he's shooting off the hip. Um, and that's the last thing you can do, the worst thing you can do in a global pandemic like this. Yeah, and that same media, there uh, there is a piece in FAIR, I'll tweet it out again later, but that same like, you know, media that's supposedly victimizing him all the time is still, running his press conferences, which are yeah. campaign rallies. They're still doing reports that even in any way that, that don't just clearly delineate between the absolutely insane bullshit he's saying that will endanger millions of people versus the uh, scientific consensus. So even as he whines, once again, be really careful about seeing that actually a lot of papers and a lot of mainstream corporate news are still actually going extraordinarily easy on the guy. And that's actually the real story of this time, no matter how many times they get offended by him or whatever. Um, all right, folks. Uh, again, uh, if you can, this is a really good time to go become a patron, patreon.com slash TMBS. You need a deal. Let us know. We will absolutely help you out. Um, and, uh, smash the like button, subscribe, 
all of that good stuff. Ton to get to on the post game. Ben Burgess and Joshua Khan Russell are going to be joining us. We're going to talk about uh, the OAS, the Bolivia coup. We're going to just basically talk about how amazing Cuba's medical program is. We're going to do a line by line, well, not line by line, but a pretty thorough debunk around this Thomas Friedman column because, again, this is going to be the upmarket version of get back to work and danger people's lives, um, which has led to the UK. A, a similar version of this dangerous, horrifying delusion is actually the reason why the UK is in part of it, why is it's in such an extreme situation for the next three weeks, which of course does profoundly threaten civil liberties. Um, you know, uh, follow all of us, check out Matt's Patreon. Uh, there's going to be a two part series for patrons with Joshua Khan Russell. There's going to be an extra bonus stream with Shahid Buttar on Nancy Pelosi's failures and on uh, the fight for civil liberties. Um, uh, and holding back the national security state in a time of crisis. This is really urgently important stuff right now. Um, I, on Friday, I'm going to be doing a stream with Doug Lane about my book, Against the Web, The Cosmopolitan Answer to New, Le New Right at Zero Books. And I'll be doing more standalone streams on this channel. David might too, Matt might too, or uh, Matt you might find on the Literary Hangover channel. Uh, and also, I don't know the time yet, but Friday, I'm also going to be a guest on um, Navarra Media uh, as well. So uh, we'll see you on the post game, patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, guys. See you guys back here in about 10, 15 minutes. See you, everybody. All right. Bye-bye.